All right, so remind me, what's the, what is the concept of pipelining? Why do we need it? What's the, what's the deal? What would happen without pipelining? Give me a quick review. Okay, things wouldn't be as fast. So pipelining makes things faster. How? Makes the process of getting the next, you know, whatever instruction more efficient, faster. Okay. Uh, what example does the book use to describe pipelining? Laundry. Laundry, right? So doing laundry. So if you were uh, in an unpipelined example of doing laundry, right? Is that the only thing you read in the book? No. Is that I, I had to go through four six. Okay. So the un, the the real life example of uh, an unpipelined version of doing laundry, you put your stuff in the wash, you wash the clothes. Take it out of the wash, you dry the clothes. Take it out of the dryer, you fold it. Did in the book like make a joke about like you make your roommate fold the clothes or something like that. I have my wife do that. And she does the washing. Uh, the whole process. Because <laughs> she doesn't let me touch the washing machine because you can put bleach into the wrong stuff. Do you know that? <laughs> Not if you just want to wipe everything. I guess that's true. I figured it just kills everything, right? I mean, it's, it's like a disinfecting thing, right? That's so, why I bathe in it every day. Yeah, wait, when in doubt. It, well, seriously, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, don't have time for a shower, just throw an extra scoop of chlorine into the hot tub, jump in, we're good to go. <laughs> you're actually not you're not supposed to do chlorine in the hot tub like right before you get in. That's why they have like non it, yeah, it'll like burn your skin and stuff. It's bad. Yeah, it's, huh? Probably, I think years ago. Yeah, I did. I think um one time it was that, another time it was uh the chemistry was all off and I put too much uh um, what, dealkanizer or something like that in there, so it became, the water became really basic. So you're thinking that, oh, well, too acidic is what you get burns from. No, basic is just as bad. <laughs> hey, you you want to be centered. You want, <laughs> you want the chemistry to be kind of like normal, right? Yeah, so I got like real bad burns the other way. Well, not real bad, you know, like minor, but you shouldn't come out of the hot tub like, like that. Um, what are we talking about? Oh, laundry. We get a laundry. Okay, so unpipeline version, uh, you have five baskets of clothes to do, right? So you're gonna, you have to wash, you have to dry, you have to fold, you have to put away, whatever, okay? A couple things like that. If you wash, then dry, then fold, and put away before you even start that second load, things are gonna go way, way, way slower, right? We all can appreciate that. So it kind of makes sense for us to wash the first load, get the ball rolling, and as soon as you take it out to put it in the dryer, you can put the next load into the washer. And, you know, the, when they talk about performance increase, I think the example the book used was talking about uh, if each step took the same amount of time. That's kind of the, the cleanest way of understanding the, the benefit, right? So the only loss of, of time with pipelining would be the time it takes you to remove the clothes from the washer, put them into the dryer, push start on the dryer, then put the next load into the washer. So that's overhead, for doing, uh, you know, doing the management there, but now you have a the second load is washing while the first load is drying, and then you keep working through that. And you can get a speed up of, you know, approximately the number of stages that you have in your pipeline, minus the overhead of what it takes to do the stuff, and that all assumes that each of those stages takes the same amount of time. Um, whereas typically, what drying takes longer than washing. I think that's a true statement, isn't it? Yeah. At least with my clothes. My clothes are very large. Did you say washing takes longer than No, drying takes longer than washing. I don't know if that's what I said, but that's what I meant to say. So, um, yeah. So, you're going to have the load number two sitting there done in the washer while you're waiting for the dryer to become available. Right? So, there's a lot. You know, you're, you're not using that resource during that period of time. Now, we could remove that load from the washer store it in the basket or something like that while we wait for the dryer to finish so that we can get the next load uh, going. But then what happens is you're eventually going to have a pile up of wet washed clothes that are waiting for the dryer and that kind of stuff. Um, so there's a point there where we do need to control it. Usually we don't let it get out of hand, right? Typically you'll leave the, the load in the washer 
waiting until the dryer is available, then you'll make the, the jump over to that. Um, or you just overstuff. Instead of five loads, it becomes one giant load. Right? Yeah. That also doesn't work. You just work. put two pods in instead. And it's, uh, the bigger issue with that is the drying part. Yeah, I one time tried to dry, I think, a whole bunch of clothes plus, like, a giant, like, king-size quilt thing for a bed. Yeah, nothing was dry. Three days later, still. Mold. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, my wife made me throw that out. So, yeah, it was... So, so this is why we can't have nice things. Um, okay, so, in any case, uh, that's kind of the concept of pipelining. Now... We already started mentioning a little bit some of the downsides with pipelining. So obviously there's a huge upsides. We can get more stuff done in a shorter period of time. And we're going to replace that when we start talking about this at the CPU level. Let's bring it up here in the processor because they have some decent diagrams, I think. Um, there are some good pictures in here, I think, maybe. Actually, this picture isn't bad. All right, so, you know, here's some different instructions. Here's kind of our stages of doing instructions. So, um, uh, let's see, do they, I think they list it up top here. So we have our instruction fetch, our instruction decode and register file read, uh, execution or address calculation, uh, data memory access, and then write back. So they're saying we can split up our, and this is for a MIPS processor, so those those uh, stages could change depending on your architecture and stuff. But generally speaking, these are our washing, you know, clothes washing stages. Wash it, dry it, fold it, put it away. This is fetch an instruction, decode the instruction, um, and read from your registers. Registers are fast, so they kind of combine it, combine the decode and read into the same thing. Because a lot of times the read, uh, well, not a lot of times. We, we've seen it from the operating system perspective. DOS always puts its uh, the instruction that you want to do into AH, right? So you have to read from that register to actually get the instruction to to decode what's going to about to happen. Then you actually start the execution of the instruction, or if you're storing something, you're going to go through the LU to calculate a memory address, uh, so something gets stored in a, in a good place. Then you actually start accessing real memory. Uh, and finally, if a response is required, you know, for instance, like in an add instruction where you have to write it back to a register, there's the, the callback where you, you write the data back, and at that point, the instruction is complete. So they've broken down the stages of executing an instruction into a bunch of, of, of pieces. Okay, these are the, the, the sections of our pipeline. Okay, so when we come down here to this little chart, all right, so we have uh, um, three different instructions we're working with here. All right, so uh, we, this is our first load of laundry, if you will. So we get the ball rolling with this guy. And as soon as this stage is free, so this is the washing machine, as soon as that guy is free and we're working with registers here in this first one, we can actually start the second load. So the second load is being fetched. Once this guy moves into the ALU, then the register becomes available. So we move in and so on and so forth. So in that case, we have, uh, we kind of, keep the pipeline filled so the amount of uh, wasted time is minimized. Now, if the theoretical maximum, so in this case, uh, they've described five stages, right? If the theoretical maximum is five times the speed, you know, if we take away overhead, uh, what are the drawbacks? Why might we not get five times the speed? This was, should have been in the reading. What are some things we would bump into that would keep us from getting five times the speed out of this? Sometimes you need to wait for it. Well, since the washing takes less than the drying, you, the washer is going to have to wait for the drying to be done. Okay. And what kind of, uh, so those are our hazards, right? Okay. What kind of hazard is that?
What are our, what are our options for hazards? One of them is listed here, data hazard. Then we have a structural hazard. So in this case, it's a structural hazard. We have a resource that that isn't free, right? Our, our washing machine is done. So the, the thing that's sitting in the washing machine is done processing, yet the next resource, the next structure in our pipeline isn't ready to accept the next stuff. So we have a hazard. We have to institute some sort of waiting process because now, because this guy's still working, even though this guy's done, this data has no place to go, so this guy can't start. Make sense? So we kind of have a, uh, you know, it, 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 it builds up uh, the downside. So if we scroll down here to our description of our hazard, I think structural hazard's the first one that they talk about at least. Uh, this is talking about the still in the pipeline stages. It's gotta be in a blue box, I'm assuming. Hazards weren't in. I thought the hazards were at the bottom of that one. Well, in any case, just keep cooking with this. We'll we'll bump into it at some point here pretty soon. Okay, but a structural hazard is going to be a hazard related to an actual resource. All right, so that's one thing that can happen. So that really comes down to all of our stages not necessarily taking the same amount of time. So one thing we get is we get the maximum throughput if all stages take are, are equivalent in terms of the amount of time they take. Okay, why else might we not get our maximum throughput? In this case, our five times speed up. We can keep... Okay. Yeah. So that so obviously that's going to take some slowdown. Yep. So, but let, let's if you want think about this in terms of our laundry example because that's something we're all used to. It, it's identical. So, what are some reasons why we might not? If we have uh, uh, four stages to doing laundry, what are some reasons why we might not get laundry done four times faster? Does it matter how many stages we have if we only have one load of laundry to do? I mean, we don't wash, dry, fold, and put away all in one step, so we kind of naturally break it down into stages. But we don't gain any benefit of having those four stages because as soon as that first load is done washing, we move it into the dryer, the washer's sitting there empty. We have nothing else to put in there. We don't have enough work to, to, to do this, right? So... One thing comes down to the nature of, uh, of work and something you, uh, those of you who are in the operating systems class, if you're talking about the, the nature of the uh, CPU manager of the operating system, one of its roles is to keep the, oper is keep the processor busy as close to 100% of the time as possible. That's its job. Now, uh, how often does that happen? How often is your, is your CPU actually busy on your computer on average? Yeah, or or I or idle. You can answer it either way. How what percent of the time is your CPU idle on your computer, or how often is your CPU busy? Oh, really? Yeah, it's pretty far the other direction. Right. Your CPU is idle something on on average something like ninety six percent of the time. Doing nothing. Doing nothing. I don't believe it. That's, that's, and and actually the pipelining is is, is actually part of that. You mean like when it's off? No, 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 no. When it's on. Our computers are so fast right now, the amount of work we're giving them to number crunch and stuff like that, it, it gets burned through. We do the laundry so fast that the CPU sitting there waiting for the next instruction because it's not available yet. You know, this is happening at the microsecond level. Why don't I get 60 FPS left? Well, that's not related to your CPU. It's related to your GPU. Yeah, the time that your your computer is least latent is least idle is when something like a game or something is playing. Would you ever be idle when I have a game on? No. Oh, okay. Actually, there, there's 
That's not a true statement. The answer is yes, but we're a very small percentage of the time, and you're going to have to look for those little pockets of idle. You know, time when the washing machine is sitting there doing nothing because the dryer is still going. You know, that, that eight minutes or something like that of time where you, there's just no choice. You know, we can't take this into this until this guy's done. And that's going to exist at the processor level as well. But in, to your point, when you're doing something like a game where it's a, it's a, it's a long-term number-crunching exercise, there is a plethora of data stuff to work on. So the chances of us having a whole lot of breathing time before the CPU is low. But under normal circumstances, like right now, I'm, 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 I'm on my computer. I have several different applications open uh, at once. I'm also doing a video recording. We might assume that my processor is busy 100% of the time. Reality is I'm, I'm guessing it's probably busy 50 or 60% of the time right now. It's under heavier load than normal, but I mean, it's not, it's not having trouble keeping up. You know, the, the, the processor is fast enough to stay ahead of the, the workload that we're giving it. All right, so from an operating system perspective, one of the things we try to do is keep the processor as busy as possible, as close to 100% of the time as possible, but we're at the mercy of the amount of work to do, right? Same thing's true here. In our homes, we're not doing laundry 24-7. We don't have an endless supply of clothes to wash. So even if we haven't done laundry in two weeks, you know, we're still talking about a couple of hours in the afternoon that we do our little pipelining technique where our, you know, our, our four, four stages are really helping us out. But after those two or three hours, it's the, the washing machine sits idle. You know, I'd like to say I, that the washing machine is idle at my house right now, but I just don't know. One of the days of the week is, I think, towel day. Because I always go home and when I wash my hands, there's no towel to dry on because my wife doesn't love me. <laughs> I think that might be Tuesday, so I'll, I'll find out shortly. <laughs> yeah, I know Saturdays are bed linen day because I, I have to take my, my nap someplace else because the bed doesn't have any, any covers on it. I'm not allowed to j jump on the bed without covers on it. Yeah, I know. All these rules. See, I have a bargaining chip now since it's getting close to winter where it's fireplace season, so I'm in charge of all things fire. Oh, God. Yeah, she's afraid of it. She won't, she won't turn it on. She won't turn it off. She's afraid of the fire. And I'm like throwing sticks in there, watching them burn up. When she takes me out to the mall, she puts a little leash on so I don't wander off. It's, yeah, it's really embarrassing, actually. It's, it's, <laughs> it's kind of a bad situation. Um, yeah, so in, a, in any case, pipelining on paper is an efficiency builder, but we're not using it 100% of the time. You know, at home, we have all sorts of different things that we do to, to organize things, make life easier, make life faster. So we all naturally do the laundry pipelining thing or the, the you know, the, the dishwashing pipeline thing, you know, whatever. We can come up with all sorts of examples of, you know, pipelining that we, that we do and things happen, have to happen in a certain order, right? We put our foot in the shoe before we tie the shoe. You know, if you tie the shoe first, then... Or sometimes guys don't even untie the shoe and then we stretch it on and eventually you break the shoe, right? Or you don't even use your hands. You just stuff your feet into the shoe and just keep wiggling around until it, yeah, then you really break the shoe, especially when you're my size and just flatten everything. Yeah. Seriously. That's why it's bad. Um, all right. So in any case, we have times where things are just sitting idle. It's going to be the natural flow of things, okay? Computers, the same thing. Most of the time, our computers are doing nothing most of the time. But it's when we need them to do stuff, we want them to do it as efficiently as possible. Does that make sense? And this kind of goes back to, uh, I think we had the discussion early on in the semester, if we're, if we're buying a new computer, one of the last places you want to spend your money is on the CPU. That doesn't mean get a super cheap old style CPU, but I typically tell people, Buy the fastest CPU you can get until there's the price jump. Or the difference between a 2.2 gigahertz and a 2.4 gigahertz is obscenely big compared to the 2.0 to 2.2. So keep ramping up until you get to the fastest of the 
uh, the fastest you can get before it becomes uh, prohibitively expensive. Uh, then, well, really, you want to make sure you max your RAM. I almost always recommend that. Buy cheap RAM and max it. The gaming RAM with uh, uh, heat sinks and stuff in it, a human being today is not going to notice the, the speed difference. We should see that in here, right? We've, you know, we've looked at memory, and even though from a human being perspective, we think of memory as being really fast. It's one of the slowest components when we're actually dealing with crunching numbers, right? So who cares, really, if it's, you know, three nanoseconds faster to have the, the gaming RAM when we're sitting there twiddling our thumbs waiting on it anyways. That's, that's not the, you know, if, if we were constantly pushing ahead, pushing ahead, pushing ahead, you want to get everything as fast as you can be because you're not losing time. But RAM, more RAM is better than less RAM that's a little bit faster the general rule. Uh, hard drive speed is something we'll all feel. Uh, so, you know, if you're going to spend money today, a solid, a fast solid state drive with less capacity would give you a human being better performance feel than a larger capacity drive that's not solid state or a slower solid state or something like that. So spend your money where you're going to actually get real benefit um, from the, the, the system. And What's always interesting to me is that we do these things in real life, don't we? I mean, human beings make these, these decisions all the time. We don't think anything of it. But when it comes to technology, if we don't understand what's under the hood, we sometimes just make things because we think, oh, well, bigger is better or faster is, is better. When it, you might not use it. Uh, you know, I, 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 an example I've had recently is uh, we're, we've been having a – well, I had to get a new TV for uh, – my wife kicked me out of the bedroom with my computer because she wants to use the fireplace. So I'm in the basement now. Um, so I need to get a TV down there, right? Obviously. Well, you can't even buy, well, you barely can, non-4K TVs now. Well, realistically speaking, there's not that much 4K content out there. There's a lot more than there was a year ago. But re reasonably speaking, is somebody who has a 4K TV going to have a drastically better cable TV or something experience than somebody with a 1080p TV? The answer is probably not because the content's not there. You do have some better technology and color, uh, color contrast and things like that. But the point is it's easy to go out there to Best Buy or something and look at the wall of TVs and say, well, that $3,000 or $4,000 TV must be so much better than this other one. And from a technology perspective, it is. It's got the faster processors, it's got better color capabilities, whatever. It has all these things that a human being may not be able to really appreciate because the content we're trying to play on that TV isn't taking full advantage of it and, and things like that, right? Now, I know some people really think they can tell the difference, and there is a difference, you know, between the, the colors of the blacks and, and that kind of stuff, you know, because the new OLED ones literally turn pixels off for, so it's true black, I guess, but, you know, whatever. The point is, is that it's easy for us to say, well, we want the best, even though current content says that the middle of the road is probably good enough today. So from a consumer's perspective, it seems to me to make more sense to spend less today and replace it in two years then spend more today and hold on to it for five years, Some, something like that. Um, but everybody has the, But the point is, is that in real life, we all naturally do these things, right? We all like sales. We, you know, we go through this problem-solving process where we try to dis, you know, weigh the pros and cons about things. But when it comes to computers, even those of us who are supposed to be experts in computers tend to throw that out the window, right? We tend to think that, oh, well, faster processor is better. Uh, faster hard drive is, is, is better, and we don't pay attention to the, the cost on paper until we're actually the ones footing the bill, right? Well, once you actually have to write the check for it or swipe the credit card, well, then the cost might start playing into it, and you, now it's like, what's the best I can get that I can afford? You know, so then money is always the equalizer. Um, similarly with cars, you know, if you're shopping for a car, uh, how many of you are car people in here? A okay, couple, couple car people. So, do you do you always want the bigger engine? 
I mean, that, that's one of the, th the engine is one of the, the things to car enthusiasts, right? You know, they like the, the, the bigger engines, the more horsepower. It's like, oh, yeah, that thing, uh, you know, that can get you off the line and, you know, zero to 60 in negative 3.2 seconds. I mean, the thing is never stopped. Is what <laughs> okay, you have to get a lift just to get into the car. That's how fast this thing is. You know, we're under normal circumstances. Do you need to go zero to 60 in three seconds? No. You know, my, uh, uh, a buddy of mine has a, uh, uh, a Range Rover. And it's got this giant motor in it. He's tons of horsepower, whatever. And, you know, it's like, he'll, he'll say that all oh, the time I need it is, you know, when you're getting on the interstate and you need to speed up to get into the traffic. Like, I'm pretty sure the guys drive, like, little smart cars. Do they even have an engine in them, or is that just, like, kind of Flintstones? They're just, <laughs> they're just running. They can still get up to speed, right? It just takes a little bit longer. They don't, they don't go from... But car enthusiasts tend to look at the engine and say, well, I want that better engine. They, they, they can appreciate the technology, whatever, that kind of stuff, until they come down to it and have to pay for it. Right? Then that becomes the decision. Uh, but we want to understand the, the, the true benefits we're going to be getting from some of these different uh, different things. If money's no object, yeah, I always get the you know the fastest, the best. Who cares? You know, if if literally you had a blank check to buy you know buy a TV, and it wasn't whether you got the cheapest TV or the most expensive TV, it wasn't going to cost you anything else. You'd get the best TV that was out there, right? Whether you could take full advantage of it or not, you might as well. Okay, but in real life, we, we tend to problem solve a little bit differently than that. We decide where do we spend money where it makes it worth it for us. Okay, So when we look under the hood here, there's aspects of this that start telling us that certain things are more important than other things. Okay, And one of the things we've seen recurring in here is this idea that memory, not register memory, but system RAM, isn't as fast as what we thought when we drop down to the computer processing level. It's considered a slowdown, right? Okay, so that's a slow part of your, of your computer. Now, does that mean that it's not worth spending some money on speedy RAM? I would say today it makes the most sense to get the, the best technology RAM. So get your, you know, DDR3 or DDR5. Well, DDR3 is on graphics cards. DDR5 is currently your, your, your system RAM. But, you know, Make sure you're sitting in the, 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 the best technology there, but don't pay the extra for the gaming RAM unless the money isn't an issue. If you got the extra 40 bucks for the better gaming RAM, get it. You know, every nanosecond matters, right, <laughs> at, the, at the end of the day. But that's not where you're going to really feel it from a user's perspective. All right. Um, so on paper, pipelining is great. And a lot of the time when our computer is really, really busy, Pipelining is a game changer. So if you go back in the history of computing, when we didn't use pipelining in our computer architectures, things were very, very, very slow. But our expectations were different back then, and we also were working with computers that only ran one application at a time. So we started having this conversation of almost like a chicken or the egg type thing. Which came first, human beings complaining that our computers were too slow or pipelining? Was pipelining a response to us saying our computers were too slow? What do you think? Okay. So you would guess that, that people were complaining that their computers were too slow, so the, the hardware manufacturers came up with ways to make the computers faster. Oh, no, no, no. Years and years and years ago. Yeah. Okay, so when you think about kind of the evolution of operating systems, we're kind of marrying those two classes together a little bit here. Um, when do you think pipelining was probably really required? When did we absolutely need to start thinking about increasing the efficiency of how instructions move through the system? Was it when a user started complaining my computer slow? Yeah, yeah, really. I mean, so it was less about the consumer saying that, hey, this is too slow, because the consumer never had the opportunity to say this is too slow. You know, they didn't have two applications running on the computer 
and they didn't feel that things were slow. Instead, what you had is you had the idea that users were saying, oh, it would be nice if I can run more than one application at a time on my computer. Most of us, because of our ages, we take that for granted, right? We've never had a computer that can only run one application at a time. Uh, uh, you know, but all, DOS, Windows 3.1, these were all single applications, single user, single program operating systems and architectures. Pipelining wasn't as necessary. Yeah, fine, you got a little, you gained a little speed from pipelining, but do you think processors have always been dramatically faster than the uh, complexity of the applications that we're running on them? Wouldn't you think that the, the, when you think about your computer, don't you kind of view the CPU as being kind of one of the faster pieces? It can do a lot of stuff really, really, really fast, right? Um, and we've kind of discussed in here in the last little bit that most of the time that processor is not doing anything. Most of the time, what's what's a what's a really high end car? Is it a Ferrari or something? What's what's your car choice? Okay, so we got a Ferrari sitting in the driveway. Does it matter how big that uh, how big that engine is, or you know what the horsepower is when that thing is uh, sitting in the driveway without the keys in the ignition? It doesn't matter. But if we're in a, a cop chase, right? <laughs> you know, you know, we we've, we've uh, <laughs> we're on the run. <laughs> right? You probably are going to prefer to have that Ferrari versus my Ford Flex. I mean, I feel like in the snow, my Ford Flex is going to beat that Ferrari. In every other circumstance, <laughs> you'd rather be in a high-speed chase with a Ferrari, right? So when it matters, you want to have that power. But a majority of the time, the power is not helping you, right? Is that probably, do you, do you suspect at least during the history of computing, that's been a truth? That the hardware, from a, a CPU perspective, what the CPU can do, has kind of been ahead of what we tried to do with our computers, almost by necessity, right? Until we knew what the processor can do, uh, we didn't imagine what we'd want to do with our computers. So our software wasn't so complex, we per well, I say we purposely, we couldn't imagine how to make our software more complex to fully take advantage of that processor because we didn't really appreciate how fast the processor was. So generally speaking, those processors have always stayed ahead of the average software. Now, where do you see it in gaming? You know, if you had a, a gaming computer that's, let's say, a year old, okay? Best computer ever a year ago. Money was no object, blah, blah, blah. You're going to be doing pretty well for a while, right? Three, four, five months, you're keeping up. But next year, when the latest, greatest, whatever game comes out, Battlefield or, you know, something that has a lot of stuff going on at once. If you turn all the graphics settings all the way up on that game, that computer from a year ago might not quite be able to keep up. You might have to tune it down just a little bit because the thing that you spent a ton of money on a year ago can't quite max everything today. Whether that's a year or two years, whatever it is, you kind of get the point I'm making, right? Okay, there, there's a point where you bought something that was here a year ago, and now it's here, okay? So the idea is that the software was a year late for really pushing this guy to his limits. A year ago, he was beyond what the software could do because we bought the best and the best and the best. And anymore, what, how many of you have multiple GPUs in your computer? Where you have, uh, you know, not just one graphics card, but you have two or four. I think, I think four. Yeah, it's right next to my golden pony. <laughs> Those exist, right? Yeah. You have a golden pony? Yeah, his name's Bus Stallion. <laughs> <laughs> That's a video game reference. Yeah. <laughs> four <laughs> So, um, but I think that exists. There are machines where you, you literally put four yeah, graphics cards. Crossfire card. and SLI. Crossfire is AMD's. Yeah. But you can link up to four now, right? I think I last time I used SLI, I think it was just two. But I'm pretty sure there's a, a four GPU bridge now. like one card. Okay. But regardless, I mean, there is a point of overkill today, right? And a majority of the time, you know, we can have that discussion about, you know, graphic hardware. 
you know, our eyes can only handle so much. I think we had that discussion in here one time where um, a doctor thought he could uh, um, uh, basically see a million frames a second or something like that. Thought, I know. <laughs> what do you mean, thought? Don't put words in my mouth. <laughs> okay, but the, the point is, is that we have a limitation to our eyes, what our eyes are going to be able to detect. So apparently he has awesome eyes. So you don't wear glasses or anything, do you? So you must have, I mean, he could be an Air Force pilot. He, he does have better eyes than me. My eyes are garbage. All right, I mean, literally, I don't know people are in this room. <laughs> okay, I see a purple blur right here. Are you even wearing a purple shirt? No, see, that's it. <laughs> that's, that's, what, <laughs> that's what we got here. Um, so, yeah, so I, I'll take his word for it. He probably has better eyes than me, but I guarantee we can create a situation he's not going to be able to tell the difference. We can come up with hardware that 4,000 frames a second versus 5,000 frames a second, he's not going to be able to tell. Okay, I'm making numbers up, but let's just say that's the case. So there's a point where having those four graphics cards doesn't come into, doesn't play a role 99% of the time until that 1% of the time when it does. When you're in this epic battle in your game and there's explosions and stuff everywhere and all of a sudden when, when the average gaming system is just brought to its knees, okay, he doesn't even notice the difference. <laughs> just, uh, for me, it doesn't even matter. I'm, half the time when I'm playing games, I'm not even at my computer. I just have a bot to play. I got my account banned. Did I tell you that? Yeah. Sad day. Sad day. But I started again. We're fine. Um, so punchline is, is that... Uh, um, we have those massive hardware spikes for that rare time when we need it. But generally, with software, we're playing catch-up to our processors. So the game that comes out next year is the one that's going to press our hardware from today. All right? Not always the case, but generally. Which actually it makes a, a, another interesting problem for game makers. So how long do you think the average video, you know, big, big title video game takes to make? What's our, you know, what, what's the current cool two game? Years. Two years? Two yeah. Years. Two, two, three, four years. I mean, these big games. I mean, they're not a three-month project. They're two or three years with, with uh, tons and tons of programmers working on these things. Um, so uh, what did the graphics cards look like three years ago compared to today? Slower? Okay. Yeah, so I mean... They, are the graphics cards today far more capable than the graphics cards from three years ago? And the graphics cards from three years ago were far more capable than the graphics cards from three years before that and stuff like that. Now we're kind of moving into massively parallel stuff. Well, we've been for a while, but you know, every new graphic card that comes out, we're not necessarily seeing drastic uh, increases in GPU clock speed. We're seeing drastic increases in GPUs, right? Where, you know, you have 4,096 parallel processors in some of these uh, some of these cards. It's, it's getting to the point of being ridiculous. Um, but, so the point is our graphics card today is faster than our graphics card from three years ago. With that in mind, if you're a game maker and you're starting a game three years ago, you have to try to make a guess for what the hardware will be like when your game is done. When you're creating your world size and the memory footprint that you're using and the, uh, uh, you know, the textures, all this stuff, you're having to make a guess of what technology might be like. And they've gotten pretty good at that, but every now and then you'll have a game that comes out, and day one, the best hardware that's on the market can't play it. Or can't can't maximize it, right? Just on retreat, you said that if you have like a 10, like one of the best graphics cards, and you want 60 FPS, uh, you have to do it on both settings. Okay. But what will happen is in a couple of months, the next graphics card will come out and we're, we're kind of back to where it needs to be, right? So every now and then you'll have software break this rule that I'm talking about. But when we talk about games, we're pretty much talking about our highest performance type of expectations. Your average software application, like for example, if you uh, install the latest Microsoft Word, have you ever really sat there and said, you know what, I really need a faster processor to run this version of Microsoft Word. Usually, if you're saying that to yourself, you said it to yourself three weeks before that because your computer's just old, right? It's not running anything very well right now. 
you upgrade it to the latest operating system, and it's just a little bit too much for your machine. It's not because Microsoft Word was just the, you know, the straw that broke the camel's back. It was, you know, you had been moving in that direction for a while. So typically our processes are outperforming what we're trying to get out of them, right? Punchline of all this is processors are really, really, really fast, and they are generally not the slowdown. The slowdown exists with the things that the processors are communicating with, or with which the processors are communicating. Ah, perfect, nailed it. That's a dangling preposition thing, right? Christian worldview pro Trump. <laughs> <laughs> I had to say it because I caught his eye. Are you, have you cut down off your high yet? Still there. Still there. Still okay, yeah. I, I tested my relationship with him because uh, I text I texted him the other day. You knew I knew him, right? You texted him. He still had his phone number. Oh yeah, <laughs> yeah. You knew I, I I told you that before. Right? Yeah. So years ago, when I used to sell real estate software. Uh, I, I, I was in a mastermind group with him, so I knew him uh, pretty well a decade ago, let's say. And um, but I hadn't talked to him in probably four or five years. So I'm not like buddy buddy with him anymore. So I text. I don't know if the number. He didn't respond. So I don't know if the num I don't know if the numbers changed or he doesn't remember who I am. I think that's probably. I'm kind of unforgettable. I think right. And, you know, I'm just weird like that. But you know, uh, chances are he probably has a zillion people contacting me, and I'm not on his uh, priority list. Yeah. But um, in any case, I tried. <laughs> Got nothing out of it. What's this? What'd you say? Oh, I just said congratulations on the election. But, you know, just normal. Well, that's probably why you didn't respond. What? Because it's unoriginal. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, but that's what he's getting from everybody. You're probably right, though. There's maybe some truth to that. You know, I should have just responded, yo, what are you doing this Thursday? <laughs> just, <laughs> just, so you want to go golfing? <laughs> I've never golfed with him, which is actually weird. Because you would have thought, I mean, because we always met, like, in warmer climates for our thing. And he's a big golfer. I'm a big golfer. You would have thought at some point I would have golfed with him. I never did. Did you golf back then, though? Yeah. Yeah, I just kind of started, but, yeah, I was golfing. So, yeah, that ship is. So, what's he been up to lately? Huh? You just text him, like, so what's your yeah, what, 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 I haven't spoken to you in a while. What you been up to? What's, <laughs> what's cooking? Yeah. I think I've mentioned it in here before. I, mean, I don't know what he's like today, but he was so different in person than he is on TV. Like a very normal person. You would never guess. Now, it's possible he's a, you know, he's a loose cannon today. He probably is. But, I mean, it, it's possible he's become more like his TV persona today. Because, you know, you have all the apprentices there in the middle. But he very different in real life. At least seven years ago. <laughs> That's all I, can, I'll call it, all I can say. Um, all right, so I don't know how do we even get onto that? Oh, yeah, the pro Trump, pro Trump, yeah, the pro Trump comment. All right, so you know, punchline is, is our processors are usually not our slowdown. Okay, so this we we kind of got on this conversation talking about when was pipelining introduced and why. Okay, pipelining was really a response to what are we going to do next with our computers and how do we accomplish that? All right, when you have when you have processor technology that runs at speed X. And all of a sudden you decide, okay, well, this is, this is keeping up when we have one application running. But our users are demanding or, you know, innovation demands that we need to have more than one program running at once. What do we need to do in order to make sure that those processors can keep up? Well, so, I mean, we, when you go back to um, the, uh, you know, let's, let's kind of look in the, the mid-90s compared to today. So in 1994, let's say, a, you, know, you might have had a 386SX 25 megahertz processor. 25 megahertz. Now our processors today are measured in gigahertz. You know, not even taking into consideration the difference in architectures, the 386 architecture versus, and we've looked at the 8086 architecture in here, right? So we've looked at the DOS 8086 API and, and that kind of stuff. So we kind of have an appreciation for, like, let's call it the beginning. 
So we can imagine 386 was the upgrade, upgrade, you know, 286 and 386. So it was the, the upgrade twice over of that. So what did they do? They added more magic tricks. They got a little bit better dissipating heat. They started adding math coprocessors for taking over some of the math stuff, um, specialty math stuff. But whatever, you know, they're, they're upgrades in each other. So as we got better at taking the same, uh, the, the, the same footprint and putting more stuff in there, we, uh, we were able to come up with more magic tricks, which then translates into a faster processor. As we got better at dealing with heat, we were able to bump the clock cycle. So we went from, you know, 8 megahertz to 13 megahertz to 25 megahertz to 66 megahertz to 120 megahertz, so on and so forth. We kept bumping it, bumping it, bumping it. And a couple of times in there, we would see a difference in physical CPU size. You know, if you look at an old 8086 chip, I think we looked at a picture of it at some point, but um, it doesn't look like our, sca our square processor today. It was more elongated, yeah. So this guy is, uh, you know, so here, 1978. This is the 80, uh, uh, 8086 uh, processor. Oh, look at that. It has AMD on it. It's interesting. Um I didn't realize AMD was actually uh, in the business of microprocessors back then, but well, whatever. Um, so in any case, you know, this was the chip. These were the pinouts for it. So when you look at a processor now and you look at the bottom, it has a zillion pins coming off of it. This was what we had before we had those zillion pins. So eventually, we, they changed the form factor in order to make that next jump into our next processors. They had to change the form factor of the thing. Um, so we had went, went through that, but we've had kind of the same form factor for processors for like the last 10 years. Um, things that have changed maybe is the number of pins that are coming out of the bottom of the processor. Maybe about every, seems like maybe every three years or so, every four years, you get that next bump in processor in terms of the number of pins that come out of it, which means that the old motherboards aren't compatible with it. Go ahead. Yeah, but they still have contact points. So yeah, instead of having physical pins that can that can um, uh, get bent and stuff like that, they still seat, and you know there there's a, a, a metal connect. It's, like the same thing. it's the same thing, yeah. Just why have a pin that can get bent, and um, you know. But so the, the the but the point is is that every now and then they they move towards changing the form factor, but they can't do that too often because there's there's all sorts of things that keep us from making those changes. You know, you make that processor bigger, that means you have to make the motherboard bigger. At least, you might have to make the motherboard bigger. Okay? You make the motherboard because there's, there's uh, um, you know, standards with motherboards. You know, when you buy a computer case, that motherboard has to fit inside that computer case. And if you go to a larger motherboard, all of a sudden it's not going to fit in all cases. So you have other things that are restricting innovation when it comes to processors. Restricting innovation when it comes to memory, you know, all sorts of stuff. So you, you're playing this game within this cube. All right. Um, so for a while, our processors were faster than we needed them to be. But then all of a sudden we had this desire to have the kind of the next evolution of our operating systems where we can run more than one application at once. Well, that desire is going to now require the problem solving to say, Okay, now if I have two programs running at the same time, whatever that means, how do we, how do we make two programs run at the same time with a, with a single core processor? How do I make my processor more capable of being able to keep up with that? You know, because when we built this processor, we built this processor with the best that we had given constraints of cost and, and things like that. You know, even today, you know, Intel, I think they have a theoretical, uh, well, that's actually not theoretical, it's a physical chip, but they have a, you know, a, a, a re, an R&D chip at uh, headquarters that has like 1,024 cores in it or something like that. You know, it won't fit in our computers, you know, but it's, a, it's, they have it functioning and now they have to figure out how do we make it fit inside of a tiny computer without, you know, like melting your house. Um, so, but you know, these are the things that we've worked on. So when they came out with the 8086 processor or the 286 processor, they were trying, you know, they, they, this architecture was the best that they could do to hit a price point and 
work within all the other heat and, and heat requirements and all that stuff. All right, so it was pushing the envelope of what was consumer ready. Um, you know, in the the, the late eighties, uh, mid eighties, early nineties, so on and so forth. All right, now when you get to that point, now you're saying, okay, well, what we want to do with these processors is more. I want to be able to run more than one application at once. From us today, that doesn't sound like a big thing. Like, well, haven't we always been able to do that? But well, we haven't. It seems like a no-brainer to us today. But actually, several of you have actually used an operating system that hasn't been able to run more than one program at the same time. How many of you have been uh, iOS users for a while? Okay. iOS, in the, if you looked at the early days of iOS versus Android, so, you know, let's call it eight, eight, nine years ago, eight years ago probably is when the commercials were still out, uh, you would have the Android commercials talking about how, you know, iOS didn't have multitasking, right? If you wanted to listen to Pandora, you had to have the Pandora app open, Right? And the Apple people, they pointed to Android and said, well, your battery life sucks. This has been going on forever, right? Um, well, and I mean, I've, I've mentioned this in other classes before, the reason why Apple didn't have multitasking is because it was attached to a battery. You know, we're still figuring out what's the best way to give us the most performance while carrying around a battery. Android is based on the Linux operating system, which is a great operating system. But their multitasking model is based on a desktop multitasking model, which assumes your computer's plugged into the wall. Or that you have a giant battery in it on a laptop, not something that fits in your pocket. So Apple said, well, we can't figure out how to do that and maintain the battery life that we want to brag about. Because every single time Apple comes out with a new announcement, the battery life always stays the same or gets, you know, it extends, right? You know, like, well, our We've doubled the performance, same battery life. And the device is you know, thinner than it was before. You know, whatever. That's, that's Apple's thing. Like, look at how much ingenuity we've come up with. Um, so Android had the multitasking where Apple didn't. So if you used uh, iOS for the first, I think it was like at least two years, maybe the first three revisions of iOS, there was no multitasking. I mean, heck, there wasn't even an app store in the first, <laughs> the, the first two releases. So, you know, punchline is, is that we've used devices that didn't have multitasking. and didn't have multitasking for legitimate reasons. That was battery life. You know, is it okay? We never use more than one application at once on, our, oh, actually, that never is the wrong word. We rarely use more than one application at once on our uh, devices. And when we do, it's usually an audio application in the background. Right, that, that's running music or something like that while we're browsing the web. Or, so it's typically a very small subset of applications that we're using. So Apple's approach to multitasking from an operating system perspective was to rather than have full applications running completely simultaneously, let's allow an application to register a part of itself with play music in the background with the operating system or get GPS coordinates with the operating system in the background. So only part of it is running in the background instead of the entire application. You know, but now, battery technology has gotten better. Uh, you know, our processors are getting faster, and they use less horse. They use less uh, um, electricity to begin with. So we have all sorts of things that start lending it towards. You know, our mobile devices can start using a standard memory model for multitasking, and it's not going to be the end of the world. You don't see the companies. Uh, pointing fingers at each other of who has the better battery life and stuff like that anymore. They, they're all pretty good, right? You know, within a, I mean, if you're, no longer do the Android users have to download the app to kill uh, running apps. Remember those days? Yeah, the, the most popular apps on the Android app store was the app to kill other apps because they were running in the background killing your battery. Full running app running just like it was a Linux operating system using your battery. It wasn't that Android was buggy. It was using a great multitasking model. Just one that expected you to charge your phone often. <laughs> so it was the, the, the punchline. So we keep pushing the technology envelope with this stuff. Now, if we look at the history of computing, we talked, uh, I think I mentioned it last time, if it were, or not last time, the time before. Uh, if I remember correctly, Dover came up with the, the vacuum tube, right? 
What, what's a vacuum tube? What is that guy? Light, light bulby thing? What, it, what do we use it for? Yeah. Okay. And when we were using vacuum tubes, how big were computers? Big. Right? Correct answer is big. <laughs> okay. They weren't this size. They weren't this size. They were this size. <laughs> they were like this room or bigger. You know, this would have been a pretty compact computer back then if it fit in this room. You know, a lot of them were gymnasium size computers back then. And they could do far, far, far less than our computers can today. They had a physical space requirement because of the technology they had in them. What drove us to be able to have smaller computers? What did we invent that allowed the computers to get a lot smaller? Transistors. Okay, now you mentioned that a vacuum tube, the job of a vacuum tube was to represent a zero or a one, right? Go back to this here. That's the job of a vacuum tube, represent a zero or one. Now, we look at them and they kind of look like light bulbs, but there, there's a little bit more to it than that. They're filled with a, uh, you know, a, a, it's a vacuum, but a, a gas is released in there that uh, has a resistance to electricity. And once the electricity builds up to a certain point, the gas, you know, fluorescence. So it's, that's how they worked. But in order to represent one bit, we had something that was this big, you know, kind of the size of a soda can or something like that. All right, so that's one bit. So if we want to have a 32-bit number, it's a lot of soda cans to represent one 32-bit number. So back then we didn't use 32 bits. We used 8 bits or 16 bits. That's why we had to use those smaller things. Not just, I mean, this, this predates memory size, right? We could represent a lot bigger memory with enough physical space back then. So with enough electricity and enough physical space, we can represent large chunks of memory. Hey, you want a 128-bit number? No problem. I need enough electricity to drive 128 vacuum tubes. I need enough room with plugs for 128 vacuum tubes, and we can represent a 128-bit number. No harm, no foul. All right, so vacuum tubes allowed us to represent a zero and one. This is digital logic, right? So what came next? Well, the big thing was our transistor. What's the purpose of a transistor? What problem does that solve? Okay, well, it's smaller, but what problem does a transistor actually solve? This guy solved the problem of representing a zero or one. What did a transistor solve? Representing a zero or one. Same thing. Okay, but instead of a giant light bulb, it's a little tiny thing. And that's if we were actually working with, uh, you know, a, a physical circuit version of that. You know, once we started integrating these things into uh, silicon. Um, then all of a sudden, I mean, we can have lots of transistors in a very small uh, uh, space. Uh, why silicon? So most of our chips, even today, are silicon-based. What's, what's the nature of uh, silicon? Why did we, after we moved from, um, you know, these, these uh, light bulbs that plugged in and moved towards these, you know, this idea of transistors, why was silicon something that was an important uh, material? Go ahead. Okay, what does that mean to be a semiconductor? Okay. Control conduction. Yeah, control conduction. So, um, so for instance, water is an extremely good conductor of electricity, right? But it's not a controlled conductor of electricity. Okay? You don't want to be swimming during a lightning storm. Bad, right? Semiconductors have controlled conductivity. So... We have time. We can build in time between when electricity goes from here to here. Okay, it, 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 it gives us a, a period that we can work with 
so that things we can integrate problem solving in the middle. Okay? So now transistors, at the high level, we see these guys represent zeros and ones. Okay? They, saw, they actually do two different things, transistors. Has the book talked about transistors yet? Okay. Um, they do two different things. One of them is a transistor acts as a switch. On or off, zero or one. That's, that's the problem we're looking at here. Anybody know what else a transistor can do? That was actually some of the very early uses of a transistor. I spell that right? Amp amplify. Let's go with that. Oh, good. Spelled it. So it amplified a signal. Why might that be good? When you think of an application where amplifying a single uh, a signal is uh, be beneficial. When you when you hear amplifier, what does that mean? You know, what does that immediately tell you? What is that? What, what comes to mind when you think about an amplifier? Say this again. Louder. Louder. Music, right? So when you have an amplifier, when you put an amplifier in your car, and you put the big speakers in there or something like that, you put the amplifier in there to the, drive the big subwoofer and, and the bigger speakers and that kind of stuff, right? So you get the thump. All right, so you're going to take that normal signal, okay? So he's in back of his Ferrari, okay? <laughs> he's, got, he's got the crazy sound system. <laughs> you know, he literally has to wear like this noise canceling headphones with nothing going through them, just noise canceling <laughs> to drive to the grocery store. All right, so we use an amplifier to take one signal and boost it to be a louder signal. Okay, or be a stronger signal. And if we harness that signal through a speaker, then we get louder sound than our original input, right? Okay, so one of the early applications of transistors was in hearing aids. So think about how, you know, how many people do in, this, in the country, I don't know the number, but a lot of people wear hearing aids, hearing aids, right? It's a common thing. What did we do before transistors? Basically yeah, they had, they had like the things that, that, that looked like a, the French horn kind of sticking out of there. Um, you know, they, they, they try to take energy and squeeze it down to get it, get it into there, take the sound and, and uh, uh, funnel it towards their eardrum. Okay, with a transistor now, we can create something that fits inside their ear and takes in a signal and amplifies that signal. So they just needed a little speaker, but a little speaker goes a long way when it's sitting right next to your eardrum. Right? You know, you don't want the giant subwoofer right next to you. It's bad news bears. Okay, so, um, but a transistor really created something that's really necessary for people today, right? I mean, now we can listen to as loud of music as we want because we know that when we get older, we'll be able to get the... the <laughs> and that's, how, that's what I took from it, right? I really cranked my audio books up. What's up? Well, I got to be able to hear it, especially when my wife's in the car. Because when we're taking a long trip and I'm listening to it, she she sleeps. You know, my wife stays conscious in the car uh, 15, 20 seconds. So I have to do the 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 audio on just half the car. Like I always wondered why did they, why would anybody ever use that for the different sizes? But no, I do. So it's audio left side front. So I'm just surrounded by audiobook. And she's over there snoring, interrupting my audiobook. Usually I take a nap too and let Mr. Gonzalez drive. Um, all right, so um, transistors have two functions they act as a switch, that's our zero and one representation, and they also amplify things. Okay, now, uh, does anybody know how a transistor actually works? Anybody seen one before? Huh? You know, in some ways, in some ways, transistors are very difficult to... Oh, really? He's like, I don't know. Yeah. It's a short answer. Okay. Well, so I'll explain. I'll, I'll explain how a transistor works. Um, but in some ways, they are very difficult to explain how they work. So we'll draw a little picture. All right. So... 
Actually, I'm going to do it this way. Trying to think of the actual voltage. This might be made up. I think it's 0.7 volts. I think. So when I explain this in a second, it'll make sense, but don't take my word for that 100%. Um, so the way this happens is. Uh, a, tr a, a transistor has three little rods coming out of it. All right, here, let's look at a picture of a transistor here real quick. Oh, wrong, I spelled that wrong. All right, so here's a, here's a transistor. So three little rods coming out of it, okay? We have a collector, we have an emitter, and we have a base. All right, so three things. The base is the electricity that comes in that turns the switch on or off, okay? And it's a very low voltage that's hooked to this base. So when voltage comes into the base, the switch is turned on, but it, the, the punchline here is it does not take much power to turn a transistor on, all right? So, you know, it, the, the idea is you could have lots and lots and lots of transistors without that much power in order to, 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 to run them, to represent zeros and ones. Now think about that in comparison to the, the light bulby things, right, or vacuum tubes. I can't tell you the exact number, but it was a lot higher than 0.7 volts to, to, run a, um, to, to, to run one of those guys. Okay, so when a relatively small amount of electricity is applied here, that electricity Oh, I keep doing that instead of this. Then flows to the emitter, which amplifies it across the collector, which then has energy that comes out. Okay? So this guy emits a flow of electrons this way. Don't get too caught up on the electron stuff. But it emits electricity this way, and this electricity is, at, depending on the transistor, much larger than 0 0.7 volts. That's the amplification aspect of it. The switch aspect of it is this guy is only activated. That guy only switches on when a small amount of electricity is applied to the base. Otherwise, it's off. Does that make sense? So that's how a transistor works. It represents a single zero or a single one. Okay? Now, um, the amplification aspect of it is actually a benefit sometimes, but a hindrance other times. Because sometimes you want to represent a zero or one, but you don't really want more out of your signal. Right? I mean, if you, if you have a bunch of transistors daisy chained together, okay, and I've mentioned that the voltage that comes into the base is relatively small. I mean, you, you're basically applying the minimum amount of electricity that you can uh, to that. But if your output out of this transistor is a lot higher energy, that might not be usable energy. Okay? Um, well, it'll always be usable, but the thing you're flowing that energy into might not be able to accept uh, that level of, uh, of energy. 
So we need to have various components that allow us to uh, die down electricity. So we have all sorts of things that we can use to either, uh, we can have capacitors which start collecting energy. So a, a capacitor, you know, we're going to say this is one of our Legos. Okay, so this is a widget. This guy has energy that comes in. The capacitor can store that energy. And then the energy it, that it lets out is of a certain voltage. So you get a smooth amount of voltage coming out of a, uh, out of a capacitor. You have inhibitors. Okay, an inhibitor or resistor okay, is something that, you know, uh, it has a certain voltage to it. And basically it acts as a wall when a high voltage is coming up against it, and it only lets a, a, a certain amount of that come through, okay? So these are things that we can use to control the flow of electricity uh, through, this, through the system. And this would be stuff you would talk about in like a, a physics class or a computer engineering type class. So we're not gonna get into the electricity aspect of it. These, just think about them as the widgets themselves. So what does a transistor do for us? It's a widget that represents zeros and ones, okay? So for, uh, Thursday, I'll put it up on Blackboard. I want you to write a two to three page, to be double spaced, paper on comparing vacuum tubes to transistors. We want to gain an appreciation for what those things did, how they worked, and why transistors are so much better. Make sense? All right, I will see everybody on, what's today is Tuesday, right? Yeah, I'll see everybody on Thursday.